Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 36 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. I had such a great discussion with my friend Nancy Berg for this episode. Nancy is the co-author of Reboot Your Life, Energize Your Career and Life by Taking a Break. I invited her to be on the show because I've heard from a number of listeners who are wondering if it's okay to take a sabbatical type break from work after becoming a widowed parent, and also looking for ideas on how to make that work. I knew right away when I first got a listener question on this topic that I just had to talk to Nancy about it. I've read her book several times in the past few years, so I knew that it was full of information and examples. That would be helpful to my listeners who are thinking about taking time off work. Some topics that Nancy and I discussed include the benefits of taking a sabbatical, both personally and professionally, common concerns that people have about taking a sabbatical, advice for talking with employers about taking time off, considerations about how much time to take, suggestions about how to structure your time off, how taking time off can help you reconnect with yourself and what is meaningful to you, and how giving yourself the gift of time can be incredibly important for anyone, including widowed parents. I hope you enjoy my discussion with Nancy Berg. My guest today is Nancy Berg, who is joining us from Portland, Oregon. Nancy has had a long career in international security policy, having served as National Security Advisor to the Vice President of the United States and on the National Security Council staff and in the Department of Defense. Since her career in government, she's been at various nonprofits and has authored numerous books on national security topics. She is also the co-author of Reboot Your Life, Energize Your Career and Life by Taking a Break, which is the reason I've invited her on the show today. Nancy is also a longtime friend, and I'm so glad she's here today to talk with us about sabbaticals, or as she likes to call them, reboot breaks. Nancy, welcome. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you here. Um, So I got this question from a listener, and I knew right away that you were the right person to ask about this. So let me just start off our discussion here by sharing this question um, that I got. So a listener asked, If finances allow, is it okay to take a break from work? I'm not sure if I mean quitting, maybe just asking for unpaid leave. I feel my first job now is taking care of my kids and our family's emotional needs. My husband died a few months ago, and we have a teen and a tween. Complicated ages at any time, but now with a layer of grief. I am afraid of letting go of my work, but I don't know how to continue in my same capacity. My employer has been so accommodating, but I just don't know how to balance everything. So I think this is such a great question, and I've heard similar themes from other listeners as well. Um, So before we get into the specifics of her question, let's just talk a little bit about sabbaticals in general um, and what you've learned from research in your book. So first of all, how did you get involved in writing a book about sabbaticals? Well, first, I I just want to say my sympathies, uh, my deepest sympathies are with any of your listeners and um, certainly the woman who wrote that question. And it's a very good question. And it it shows a lot of self-awareness, I think, Mm -hmm. caring for the kids, obviously. But the way we got started on sabbaticals, uh, I I met uh, several women at a women's leadership conference, and we were sitting at a table talking, there were four of us, and we were talking about ways to live our life well. And part of that was to take breaks from work. Mm. We had all taken a sabbatical, although we we didn't really even know to call it that because we weren't in the academic world. It wasn't an academic sabbatical, mm-hmm. but it was a break from work. So we talked about it at that conference, and a year later we talked again, and we decided to write a book on the value of taking a break from work. And we did. We just undertook to do it. And since then, uh, we have been doing workshops and we have formed a company. And it really is all about um, helping people think about taking a break. And then we've also evolved into words about planning your next chapter. Mm. And sometimes people talk about planning their next chapter and they don't even realize that they're going to come around to the idea that 
taking a break is good. And the break itself can be a next chapter or it can be the transition to a next chapter. Um, but we, we just sat down and started writing this book and, and um, came out with it. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I, you know, I, well, I think I've told you this, I read the book several years back. Um, I've actually yeah. read it several times since then. Uh, <laughs> My makes me feel so good. Jimmy's reading the book again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I first read it, I thought, I need one of these sabbaticals. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was before my husband died. Um, yes. And, you know, it's been this long until I've been able to figure out how to make it work. Um, but as you know, and as listeners know, I've been, I'm doing the podcast now, and it's a very different break from um, what I was doing before, which has been, uh, it's been a lot of fun and interesting. But not to talk too much about that here, um, I want to get back to your stuff. Uh, so you guys talked, you outlined seven different types of sabbaticals. Some of them involve going back to school for a career change or maybe taking a volunteer break. Um, but the ones that I think maybe most relevant to our discussion today, you talk about a, a family-related sabbatical and an emotional healing sabbatical. Um, I'm thinking that that might be the kind of thing that my listeners, you know, may be thinking about doing. So what, I'm wondering what you found, you know, in your, in your research or talking to people for your book, um, what kind of, you know, people's experience or value they find in taking that type of leave. Right, right. Yeah, we, you mentioned the seven different kinds. Uh, People have different motivations, you know, and, and even with you, your motivation changed over time. You thought you might take a break at some point for career, and then it ended up being different. And then when Dennis passed away, that, that was a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. So people have different motivations, but you're correct. Uh, the two types you, you talked about, emotional healing and family-related, do relate to what we're talking about. And so what that would be, a family-related one, um, is is taking time off when when it would benefit your family. For example, some people take time off in the middle of the summer because their children are home. And that benefits their family. But when you have a a case, uh, you know, uh, the, the widow um, who has children, it's definitely family related to want to take a break for the um, the well being of the family. And so the family can gain new perspective on things. Um, but it also, at the same time, is very much an emotional um, related sabbatical um, where, you know, it's not just a fun summer, <laughs> you know, taking time off of work to be with your kids and go to the beach. It's, it's emotionally laden because of uh, the whole family going through the kind of experience they're going through. And so, you know, we, we have examples of people. One that we write about in the book is a man named Jimmy. We interviewed um, a couple hundred people yeah. and, you know, in, who did different things to, in order to take a break and on their break. And Jimmy was somebody we talked to, and his, his wife had died. And he decided that it was important to take time off. So he took he took the summer off. The timing was such that he took the summer off and they traveled together. They traveled as a family unit and it was very uh, healing for them to be together and to do the traveling and to kind of reestablish their lives. You know, they had to kind of reestablish how their family worked, mm -hmm. um, what their relationships were. Uh, share their grief with each other, be there for each other, and taking that time where there weren't the pressures of work for Jimmy, uh -huh. have that on his mind. He didn't have to get up at six in the morning and fix their breakfast and run off to work. Uh -huh. he could be present for them. Yeah. They also took time to um, engage with family members, and since they had the time to travel, they could go to the Midwest and you know, visit relatives and reconnect with cousins and he could reconnect uh, more deeply with his siblings. And it gave them all a chance to talk to each other and uh -huh. then talk to these other people. Uh -huh. And and so it was a very uh, enriching experience. That's, that's a good example of one. Yeah, yeah. No, that's... Thank you for telling us about that. I can... So I can see... Um, the potential benefits and I'm wondering what you've found are maybe people's common 
hesitations or fears or you know concerns if they're thinking about it but they're not ju just not sure what do you what do you see yeah. in that regard you know it's it's human nature to have concerns and to have self doubts like can i really do this mm. um and so yeah, in in any kind of a decision to take a break like this if it involves leaving work or leaving the thing that you have been engaged in there will always be doubt so you're not alone if any of you are feeling that uh there are a couple uh main reason main things that cause people doubt one is money and no matter how much money people have we find they worry about money mm. am i going to have enough money to do whatever it is i'm talking about am i going to run out of money mm -hmm. and so that is a common concern and it's one that can be dealt with another concern is if you're leaving work um leaving the job either briefly or leaving it all together and then planning to do more work later in another job there is always the concern of will i be able to find another job will i lose my edge will it put me behind in my career and um so that's that's a common concern another concern people have is will i be fulfilled and will i really reach my goals on this break or will i squander it mm -hmm. well, you know people because sometimes they have high hopes for for what they're going to do on the break mm -hmm. and and they begin to doubt themselves about whether they'll actually achieve it and stick to their goals so th those are some of the main mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things that come up so um I'm curious how often then somebody, if they actually do then press ahead and, and manage to figure out how to take a sabbatical, yeah. do you find that they typically, you know, how many people regret it versus how many people are glad they did it? You know, we have honestly, for the book, as I said, we interviewed a couple hundred people. We have talked to hundreds more since then. And we have our workshops and we do, nobody has regretted taking it. Huh, nobody. So, I, there isn't anybody who has said, that they shouldn't have done it. There have been people who said, I should have planned better. Mm. It does take some planning. I mean, one of the things I like to say is, it's good to plan. You don't have to put yourself in a straitjacket where everything has to be regulated a certain way because you want to be flexible. Mm -hmm. But there are people who have said, I'm really glad I took it, but I wish I had, had planned better. Ah. Uh. Okay, let's talk about the planning piece in a minute here, um, because first I, I wanted to ask you if you could describe, you kind of break it down into two main types of sabbaticals. You call them the workplace sabbatical and the between gigs sabbatical. So can you tell us what those are? Sure. The workplace sabbatical is where your place of employment, your employer, says it's okay for you to take X amount of time off and you will come back and you will have your job or we will have a job for you, your job or a job. Mm. That's a workplace. You go from the workplace, you return to that workplace. Okay. A clean gigs sabbatical is um, where you leave that job and you don't immediately go to another one. You're mm -hmm. in clean gigs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people have another gig lined up or, you know, six months or a year later or whatever. And sometimes people don't have any idea what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And um, in both cases, they're leaving in order to, to recharge. Or it could be that they're going to get an academic degree or something. But it, it really does amount to recharging and refreshing. And, um, and dealing with what they need to deal with. But a between gigs is um, is riskier, and people do consider that a risk because they're afraid they won't be hired, or that they'll run out of money, or whatever. But that's that, those are the two definitions. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so I suppose if well, some people are lucky enough to work for an organization with a formal sabbatical program. Yeah. Um, so you know that's that's fantastic. If you're not that lucky. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to bring this up with an employer? Maybe nobody in your team or organization has done this before and you think they're going to throw up their hands and say, no way, I can't do without you or whatever. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions in that kind of situation? Yes. 
yes, I do. And and the first one is you'll never know if you don't ask. Ah, true. And so it may seem like your organization is the least likely in the world or your boss to let you take time off. But it it there's a very good business case to be made. And of course, with your audience, Jenny, there's another case to be made, which is a compassionate case. Mm. But it it is a known and proven fact that when people are able to take a break, they come back better. That's a phrase we often use. You come back better personally, you come back better professionally. Because you've recharged, you've reinvigorated, you've taken care of what needed to be taken care of. And when people um, take sabbaticals, and many companies, as you said, do offer a sabbatical program, because they know that it helps with recruitment, it helps with retention, um, it helps with the capacity to innovate, because people are more creative when they come back. They've cleared up a whole lot in their heads. Mm-hmm. They've got a lot of cobwebs and old ideas and worries out. Mm-hmm. They come back and there's a lot more space for creativity. They may have even thought of some of these new things while they're on their break but it also um, can be very positive for the culture of the organization and it also is very positive for the strength of the workforce so when you're making your case to your employer um, these are things to mention but in terms of the strength of the workforce when the when the employer has to replace you for a while they are strengthening the rest of the staff because mm-hmm. the rest of the staff is learning new things. Mm-hmm. And always when that other, when you come back, you will either be put in a, maybe even a higher position or back to your old position, but you're coming back to a stronger work team where you all can um, be more interchangeable and, and just stronger. And, and it becomes a stronger workforce. Yeah. So I suppose if, um, if you're at the point where you, you know, need to take a break, I suppose it doesn't even hurt to ask. And, you know, if they say no, then I guess you can take your between gig sabbatical. Yes. Uh, if you really are determined to, you know, that yes. I need right now to do this or I need yes. three months to do this. Yeah. Or whatever. And then, and, and some people do that. They make a plan to go in, you know, in a very reasonable way to speak to their employer you know, it's not a bad thing to have notes and, and know, you know what you're going to say. It's mm. okay to be organized that way. And to present it, you know, very logically, but also to know whether you will take the break regardless. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to decide that right when you're with the employer. You don't have to go off in a huff and say, well, I'm going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could say, well, thank you for your consideration. I hope we can discuss this again, you know, Uh maybe there would be a possibility, or maybe I don't need six months, maybe three months, you know, what would you think? You can kind of negotiate. Mm. As long as you do it reasonably and respectfully, that that person's going to talk to you. The person's not going to just throw you out of the office. And, And so that's what I recommend on that. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's switch gears here for a second and just talk about some practical things. Um, Mm -hmm. what about health insurance? Like how do people handle that when they're taking a break? Cause I think that that gets a lot of people. It, it does in life. It does. Uh, and what you want to do is particularly if you're asking an employer for time off, It's a negotiation. Like I just talked about, okay, not six months, how about three? Um, But also, you, the the weakest position is to say, okay, I'm going to work without pay and benefits. That's the weakest position, and Mm -hmm. that's not the one you want. Mm -hmm. What you want, ideally, is for the benefits to continue and for your pay to continue. Now, you, you may not get that, but I would argue strongly that you know, hopefully they could give you some pay, but let's say they say no. We, we're not in a position to pay you. What you do is you, you have them retain your benefits. Mm. And you can really make a good argument for that. 
and you need to make a strong argument. So if you're going to do a workplace sabbatical, let them continue to pay your benefits. And if it comes down to that they'll only pay the health benefit, and that's the one that's going to be the most valuable to you because that's the most expensive to get outside of work mm-hmm. and try to try to make that happen. But, you, you know, you can also say it's not just me. It's me and my children. Mm-hmm. We really need this health benefit. We're pretty healthy, but, you know, I, I, I need that. Right. And I imagine that, that they will go along with that. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you're going to leave your job and do a between gig sabbatical, I don't know if COBRA still exists. Uh, I, it, 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 it does, yeah. Oh, well, if COBRA exists, then you have 18 months where you can stay on your company's insurance. And mm. you'll have to pay a little more, um, but you will still have some kind of insurance. It doesn't make any sense to be without insurance. As sure. You no, know from having just lost a loved one. Right. Um, so, but you need to check out all the options and be sure um, if it is going to cost you more money that you have have put that into your budget. Yeah. Be cognizant on the health for sure. And speaking of budgets, I know in your book you've got some worksheets, some budget kind of checklists, um, you know, all the categories to make sure you've covered. And I also wanted to mention before I forget, I think it's maybe in the appendix, you've got a list of employers who. Um, have formal sabbatical programs, so a bunch of you know good resources there. I think that people might want to take a look at. Yes, and and we update that on our website. That uh, the book was published in 2011, so the number of companies has been growing that get mm. sabbaticals, and and um, it is considered a huge plus when companies for the quality of a company if they right. get some kind of sabbatical. I also wanted to say, because I don't think we'll have time to, to get into it in the discussion, but you do have a bunch of um, some sections in your book that talk about if you're a, uh, you know, how to talk with clients or, or um, colleagues, if you are thinking about leaving. Also, if you are a, maybe a, a solo practitioner like a dentist, you have some creative suggestions for how you might be able to make that work or yes. a solo entrepreneur. Yes, everybody's situation is different, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, and, and th- that's valuable advice in there about about how to approach it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes too, to the, the um, place on your website with the list of, you know, the updated list of employers. Um, Cause I think that'd be uh, good reference information. Um, can you talk a little bit about the length of a sabbatical and your thoughts on, um, you know, is there, what's too short? What's too long? What's the sweet spot? I think some people who work full time, might think, Oh my gosh, if I could just get a month off, I'll be good. You know, and I'm wondering what your experience or observations are on that point. Our experience is that something is better than nothing. A year is is a wonderful sabbatical because you can really get into a sabbatical rhythm. Um, three months is okay. So I would say, especially in the circumstances we're talking about, that it, it's at least a three-month thing because... You do have, you do want to get into a sabbatical rhythm where you've left the other things behind, the 24-7 you know, work and, and then, you know, a lot of the concerns you had um, when your loved one was ill or was taken from you suddenly. Um, and so I would, I would go for a minimum of three months. Six is better, nine is better, and a year is better. The length of time, you know, it gives you time to go through the different um, um, aspects uh, that occur, mm. and and in your cases, it'll give you some more time to cycle through on grief, but also just on the normal um, parts of a of a sabbatical, and and. Um, you also want to be sure to have enough time to get your mind cleared, particularly if it's a between gigs sabbatical, so that you can think anew about what you want to do next. Mm. Because, you know, if you're an accountant, you may want to go right back to being an accountant, but at a different company. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you may decide to do something completely different. This gives you time to think about that. 
-hmm. and have some experiences that might lead you in a direction that would make you and your family happier. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a minute, um, because I think you guys identify four major phases um, of the sabbatical. Let's just say you're taking a year-long, six, 12-month sabbatical, maybe. Um, So what are these four phases? Because I I think... um, I might wonder, oh, am I just going to take a year off and do the same thing every day and, um, you know, that's just the way it goes? Or what what should I expect? Or maybe how should I best use that, that time? Yeah. Um, well, what you, what you can expect when you commit to taking time off and when you, you walk away from that job, um, first of all, you can expect um, that your body will react because you've been under so much stress, both at the office or whatever kind of business you're in, uh, work you do, um, and plus you've had this enormous, enormous emotional stress. And so your body, when you give it some time, like you wake up later in the morning maybe or you you aren't as pressed, your body will react as it gets rid of the toxins. And you may get sick mm. or cold. You may, um, you know, <laughs> you may have a little adjustment to this new way of being. Mm. Keep that in mind. And um, that's, that's often called the first 30 days. But... Um, what, what you'll do in terms of how you spend your time, what we have found is that um, people kind of generally follow four phases that you mentioned and asked me about, Jenny, um, and they can overlap, and it's not the same for everyone. But what we find is the first phase is kind of clearing and organizing. And, and what happens is you, you get this desire to... Clean out your closets, clean out the junk drawer, clean out the garage, (laughs) get all that stuff done and go to all your doctor's appointments that I know you haven't been doing. (laughs) It's your turn, you know, Mm -hmm. it's your turn. You need to get your mammogram. Um, And, um, and, and people, people tend to do that. Now they're, they're also at that same time, you might have long lists of all these things to do. (laughs) I do. I do. I do. I just have to interrupt and say, right, as, right after my husband died, I ended up putting every to-do on a sticky note on my mirror, uh-huh. and, and I put them in columns by category, and oh my gosh, I had like 150 sticky notes or something, mm-hmm. and some of them were small, like, you know, paint the whatever, but some of them were whole big categories on one little sticky note, so I just... I. That's a long way of saying, yes, I empathize with the uh, long list of to-dos when you when you start off here. And I would bet, Jenny, that in that early part, you uh, didn't do very many of them. Because what happens is people get um, tired. It's these toxins getting in. And people, I remember one time I took a, a, a break. I left my job. And I went up and visited a friend in New York. I lived in D.C. at the time. I slept super late the first day. Hmm. I finally got up. I staggered out of the bedroom and into the couch, laid down on the couch, fell asleep again, (laughs) staggered into the kitchen, got some water or some coffee, went back and slept some more. And, and it's this thing where, you know, don't be hard on yourself because initially you're going to have all those lists and you are going to get the stuff done, but you're not going to get it done the first few days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so you, you want to, um, Keep that in mind, but you're you're clearing your um, you're clearing your emotional uh, closet as well as your clothes closet. Mm. Um, you need to kind of dig through and think about things, uh, kind of put your life in order. The doctor's appointments I talked about, um, and then the second phase. So the first phase is the clearing, the clearing out. And then the second phase is the, uh, the reconnection. Mm. And it's, it's really fun because you're reconnecting to yourself. You know, you might, you might go back to doing yoga. You might start meditating. 
you might just find moments in the early morning with, with yourself. And you're reconnecting with people who are close to you or people you haven't seen for a while. Mm. I talked a little bit about that with Jimmy and his family as they, as they went around and saw other people. But it's very um, invigorating to go back. And what, what people find out is during this period, they learn about themselves. They kind of reconnect. Oh, that's who I am. I used to love doing that. They also reconnect with things they used to love doing. Mm. I used to love to walk up to that park, and I haven't done it for so long. I remember what the spring flowers look like. I'm going to go up there. And mm -hmm. people begin to reconnect to things that are meaningful to them um, that maybe they haven't had, had time for lately. Mm -hmm. So that's, go ahead. Well, I just was thinking how important that is as well in the context of a major loss. Mm -hmm. People are trying to figure out now who they are mm -hmm. without their spouse, with the changed configuration of their family, like everything's up in the air. And so I'm thinking what you're talking about, reconnecting with yourself, reconnecting with your interests, reconnecting with people who are and have been meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. It seems like that could be really beneficial in terms of um, kind of processing where you're at and how you might move forward. I believe that is the most important phase for you and your listeners. Mm. Exactly the way, and you are the right one to have articulated that because it, it is all different and it is i mean just well after i was divorced uh i had to figure out who i was mm -hmm. you know i mean you it does happen at different times in life but but you know who who do you want to be i mean do you want to be the person who was married to that person for all those years or do you want to kind of reclaim you know yeah something else or what what's the best that you want to take forward right you talked about the reconfigured family and and so this is this is a super important time and it can overlap with the other times it may be what the whole sabbatical is about mm. you know mm -hmm. you're also going to clean the drawers a little bit and, you're, and then i'm going to talk about the, this next phase which is exploration but but down deep you are going to be through the whole thing continuing to reconnect to yourself, to your children, and to other people who are, who are dear to you, and to your interests, as you said. I mean, pick up the guitar again. Your kids would love to hear you play it. Yes. In fact, I actually, so my son's been taking bass lessons recently, and he invited me to crash his lesson the other week so we could learn a song together, me on the guitar and him on the bass. So that oh, was kind of fun. Well, there you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so opportunities, you know, a lot about a reboot break or a sabbatical is opportunity. Opportunities come up, mm. and they are uh, something to take advantage of. You know, somebody all of a sudden invites you to their cabin in the woods, and you and the kids go and learn to live in the woods. You know, it's <laughs> wonderful I mean, I'm just making it up. Right, for which you have time now to explore But something. now you have time to do that and to explore it. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's a wonderful thing. We, I, I did want to interject this. We, um, we, we call taking a break, uh, giving ourselves the gift of time. Mm. And so that's a term I would put in quotes, gift of time. Give mm -hmm. yourself the gift of time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to know about it is you deserve it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And also you will because we talked about self-doubts, you will need to give yourself permission to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually easier to say, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. Sure, sure. But the better thing is to be able to say, I'm going to give myself and my children the gift of time. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, I, I just wanted to be sure I got that interview. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes. And so, so what's if your you want, I'll continue on to exploration. Do you want me to... Uh, yes, please. That's the third phase. And exploration is great fun. It's uh, learning new things. And a lot of that could be could be focused on travel. But it can also be, you know, your kids have been studying Spanish in school and now you're going to learn Spanish and the whole family is going to speak Spanish. You know, that's learning something new. 
-hmm. or what you just did with with your son with the musical instruments or other other kind of things but it's fun to explore you know maybe you the family hasn't been hikers well maybe even start hiking a little mm -hmm. you know, go on some family hikes or go with friends from the neighborhood or whatever you can think of new activities and now that you have more time you're, you're more likely to be able to do them mm -hmm. and then the fourth phase is called re-entry and it is starting a new chapter so it's either going back to your workplace and getting now re-established in a working pattern um or it is re-entry into some new gig or some new way of life. And um, this is a period that you don't want to get into too soon. For example, if, you, if you're going to take a six-month um, reboot break, you don't want to get into re-entry the second week. Mm. You, know, you don't want your brain all full of all the details of what's next uh -huh. you want to take your break and as you get closer to the end of it then you want to start thinking about re-entry and if it's a matter of looking for a job or something then of course you you know you you start to make the necessary contact you make sure your resume is in shape you you know do all the things you need to do to find another job but you you want to give yourself enough time to clear out your brain and to do whatever else you need to do emotionally and in other ways before you get into all the details because usually re-entry involves a lot of logistics and a lot of details mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it will probably somewhat take you away from your children because you're going to be spending more time trying to figure out what's next so um put that in there as something you're going to spend time on near the end of the period but but don't start it too soon i would say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and one thing i'm remembering from from your book and maybe this is kind of blending back into exploration a little bit but in addition to the exploration on a personal level and a family level but from a career level as well um you know that maybe it's a chance to talk with people in different fields or explore, yeah. you know, if you've been a corporate communications professional, maybe you want to explore, for example, applying those skills in some other setting, a nonprofit or the yeah. government or something. Very important. Um, yes, as you think what you're going to do next, uh, the exploration, this is a great time. You know, it's fine. If you figure out, if you do your resume right away, that's fine because you may want to do some informational interviews mm. and you may want to also talk to friends. You know, maybe a friend is in a field that you're kind of intrigued by. Well, spend time talking to that friend. Mm -hmm. Probably weave that in. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe it's a matter of uh, job opportunities in a different city. Mm -hmm. you can, at any point during the reboot break or sabbatical, you can weave in going to that city and kind of checking it out so it is a good time to explore it's a good time also i think you alluded to this to talk to other people about what they think your skills are ah. because if you're an accountant you know that's you're an accountant you know how to do that but you have other skills too you know you may be a good manager you may be particularly good with people you may be quite creative um, you might be a really good communicator. Well, these, these are skills you're going to take to the workplace. Uh -huh. So if you do a skills assessment, uh, just, by, just by talking to people and letting them tell you things about you, um, then you have an idea how you might expand into another kind of work than what, than what you've been doing. Uh -huh. so it's a great time to explore all that. Yeah. Okay. That make that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, in terms of planning, I know we talked, or you mentioned before, that some folks have regretted not planning better. Um, how far in advance do you think somebody should start planning if if they have a chance to plan in advance? I know maybe in some of my listeners' cases they won't have a big runway for planning. So, I guess in that case, are there maybe what are the highlights that you should kind of make sure you think through ahead? Yeah, I think that's a good way to ask it because your listeners are going to 
probably be thinking of a break pretty soon rather than taking a year to plan. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, it's important to uh, figure out certain things like uh, um, when would you like to do the break, uh, for how long, um, figure out how much money you comfortably have and what the situation is. Is there going to still be money coming in or are you living on savings or, um, and, and it's also important to have a vision for what you want the sabbatical to look like. And it can be just as simple as when you close your eyes or do an exercise, if there's time I can tell you about that, you, you mainly just see yourself, holding your children's hands and walking somewhere mm. you're, you're you're with them or maybe you're walking on a beach or maybe whatever but it, it's it's important to have an idea um of what of what you're going to do maybe some activities that you've already figured out um as i said maybe the whole family wants to learn spanish or something uh, I say that because I've been trying so hard the last few years to learn. <laughs> it's, always, it's always an example I give. <laughs> but, um, and so, you know, it, so it's important to figure out kinds of things you want to do so you have a plan. So, for example, let's say there's a, um, a children's festival in Italy that you want to go to, and it's in a certain month. That sounds lovely. That's the yeah. thing you've talked about. I just made that up. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, okay, well, you, you've got to figure out when that is and how much advance time you would need, you know, and what you would want to do before going over there. And then that would have something to do with the timing and the planning. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to plan, if it's overseas travel, you have to plan early enough to get your passports. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't have passports yet. And sometimes if you have little kids, you may not. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and, uh, you know, if you if you have a business, like let's say you are a dentist and you're in a sole practice, you, you obviously have to plan, you know, probably six months ahead mm -hmm. to have somebody who's going to take over your business while you're gone, that, that kind of thing. So we do have uh, advice about that kind of thing in, in the book, about some of the key things to to think about. Another thing is if maybe you're going to rent your house out while you're gone. So mm. you need enough lead time to make sure the house is in good shape and that you find a renter for it yeah. and get that kind of thing organized. But I would say all of that can be done uh, three months in advance and you'd make it. Mm-hmm. And I'm almost, I'm thinking off the top of my head here, I might be way off base, but if you really need to do it right away, your family is really struggling. I think what the approach that I would take is say, I'm going to take 30 days, decompress, and then maybe take a week to plan or something like that. Sure. Yeah. You know, if it's an urgent situation, it's the same thing. Give yourself that gift of time. Give yourself permission and do the best you can in planning it. it. Under those circumstances, you are not going to be running off to a festival in Italy. Yeah. It's going to be more self-care and care of the kids. Right. And it may be finding a rental at the beach. You know, gotcha. It may just be getting out of the routine, getting away from the house, and that definitely can be planned quickly. Mm -hmm. And taking and, the gift of time. You know, it, it is possible. I think what you were just saying, it is possible to really need that break and to go ahead and take it. Mm -hmm. And then come back to work and, and do more planning and then work with your boss on a longer break. Ah, that's a good point. Another yeah. few months or sure. something like that. Sure. So there's a lot of ways to slice and dice this to make it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Make it work for you. Right. But you don't want to feel guilty about it. Yeah. One of the things that stands in people's way that I could have mentioned on the concerns is, oh, I feel so guilty. I'm not going to be working. I'm. My income is going to be less during that time. What are my kids going to think of me? I'm not working. You. you you, you need to get over the guilt mm, mm -hmm. to get over it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I gosh, I, we could keep talking probably the rest of the afternoon on this. I think we probably better wrap up with just a few more questions here. Okay. 
Um, so I'm thinking about if you have any tips, uh, maybe if you're talking with extended family or friends or um, who might be skeptical that you're thinking about taking a sabbatical, any, any suggestions for, for those kinds of discussions? Yes. We call those people the naysayers. Ah. And they're, you may have, you certainly will have supporters in your life who say that's a wonderful idea, that's the best thing for the kids, great. But you'll have others who say, what about your career? How are you going to afford it? Uh, it's crazy to take the kids to Italy. Um, and, and sometimes those are people who are sincerely worried about you. You know, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. example, your mother mm-hmm. might, might say, how can you cut off your income? This is crazy. Mm-hmm. You, you, know, you need to be making money to take care of the kids. So that's a, that's a concern. Um, sometimes people are jealous. They feel like they're being left out. Mm. Those are two of the kinds of people who might be naysayers. And the thing to do with, with this, first of all, communication is one of the most important words related to taking a break. You, you need to communicate with, with your children. You need to communicate with your parents if you're still fortunate enough to have them. Um, you need to communicate with close friends, and when it's appropriate, you need to communicate with your boss and your co-workers. But you'll have to figure out when that is. But you want to have communications because people don't want to feel left out, and, and they will have good ideas for you. Both the supporters and the naysayers might. And it may be that you also want to include them. You know, For example, if your mother is feeling left out, when you make this plan and the plan appears to be traveling all across the country to see everybody else. (laughs) Um, You know, when, when talking to your mother or your mother and dad about it, you you want to include them in it and say, but of course we can have special times and we'll, you know, Mm. Uh, but with the naysayers, sometimes it's just a matter of reassuring them. Mm. They think something is a crazy idea. You can just very calmly tell them, that you've thought it through, you've looked at the finances, you've spoken with your boss, the health insurance is continuing, and you really feel like this is the best thing for you and the children. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's all you need to do. Now, they may have an idea. You know, they may say, well, why don't you wait two weeks later because then X, Y, Z is better. Mm. Well, that may be good advice. Right. But um, basically, you want to uh, listen and see if naysayers have something sensible to say. And very occasionally, there will be a naysayer that doesn't count, and you don't, you just let it go. Mm. There may be somebody who keeps nattering at you and telling you you're wrong, and, you know, maybe that's a neighbor two blocks away. Uh, that person, you, you need to get over that, and, and then that person just isn't part of the consideration anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think those are some really good thoughts around that. Um, let's, let's circle back to the question from the listener in the beginning. And I just want to kind of get some of your thoughts on maybe what she should be thinking about. So she um, has a very supportive employer, um, but is having trouble balancing things, has a teen and a tween. Yes. A husband recently died, isn't sure about leaving, if it would jeopardize her career, but feels like she needs to do something. So I guess what would you say she, she should be thinking about as she thinks through this, uh, this, this option or this choice? I, I think that word balance is really uh, important. She's having trouble balancing everything. Uh, she doesn't have balance in her life. She's having trouble balancing. She's got too much with the job and this huge um, emotional load. And, I think her instinct, you know, you have to listen to your instincts. And sometimes it's your heart, sometimes it's your mind, sometimes it's your body. The instinct can be all those things. Her instinct is that she needs some time away from work. And I would guess that her employer senses that too. Mm. And that, uh, as she said, her her employer's been understanding. But I, I think that it's a good idea 
for her to, she's obviously been thinking about this, but to go ahead and make some notes and go into a conversation with her employer to kind of see what might work. Mm. You know, to have an idea of what she wants, um, you know, the number of months and, and the things she's going to really be firm about. But to, you know, to open up the conversation with the employer and to also have some ideas about how the office, if it is an office or whatever business, how it can function in her absence. Mm. You know, so-and-so might step in and do this. I think that this and this can be combined, um, you know, without telling the employer what to do, but to, to have some ideas about how things could work in her, in her absence. I mean, it might be, depending on how senior she is in the structure, it might be that she commits to be on a once a week, uh, one hour call. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, you, you go in there with, with a willingness to figure it out, but your goal is to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I think, I think that's a great place to end. So thank you very much. Um, my guest today is Nancy Berg, who is the co-author of Reboot Your Life. And so, Nancy, where can listeners find you if they'd like to learn more about your work and find your book? Okay. Well, we have a website, rebootbreak.com, and it can also be re reached through our corporate name, which is Reboot Partners LLC. So mm. Rebootpartnersllc.com. It goes to the same site. We also have a book on, um, on retirement and uh, that next chapter. So okay. that, that we also have a journal. I'm not trying to sell things. You all just do what you want to do. But we do have a <laughs> journal that has some great quotes in it, very inspirational quotes. Um, that this might be this might be just the thing where you want to start writing. We do encourage journaling, mm. and uh, so we can uh, you can find that there. And this it's all on Amazon. Basically. Yeah, is the journal also on Amazon? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll find those links and I will put them on this on the page in case anybody wants to take a look uh, at those. So, um, so this has been so great, Nancy. Thanks so much for speaking with me today. Well, you're most welcome. Thank you. I I really was happy to do it. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Nancy Berg as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode thirty six. And hey, I was just looking at the download stats for the podcast, and I saw that I have listeners in 49 of the 50 U.S. states, and uh, I have listeners in D.C. as well. But there is one state missing, and that is North Dakota. So can you help me find some listeners there? If you'd be so kind as to share your favorite episodes on social media or tell a friend about the podcast, that would be a big help. Also, if you're loving the podcast, it would be tremendously helpful if you could leave a brief, honest review in iTunes. Algorithms being as they are, iTunes really prioritizes reviews and ratings when it comes to deciding which podcast to show people. It's easy to leave a review, and you can find a link to the right place at jennylisk.com slash apple. And if you don't use iTunes, then reviews at Spotify or Stitcher or wherever you listen would be a big help too. And in case you're wondering which states have the most listeners, number one is Washington, which I guess should not be a surprise since that's where I am. And California, Texas, New York, and Oregon round out the top five. So, hey, thanks for listening wherever you are. Until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.